the pain of waiting. Here we are. It has been a year of waiting for us together, hasn't it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. D says yes. Folks have had a few questions for me this year, let me tell you, such as when can we get back into the church for worship? When can we take off the masks? When can we sing again? We all had that question, right? When can we have fellowship time together? It's been painful waiting. It's been a pain waiting. And I'd say we are glad that the wait is over. Are we glad? We are, amen, we are so happy to be together. And you know what that does for me? I'm so happy that you want to be together in the body of Christ and as the body of Christ. So sometime in our November of last year is where we find a beleaguered Samuel. So you understand what I'm saying? So kind of where we were sitting last November is where Samuel and his congregation are sitting, okay? And Samuel is feeling a little beleaguered. Did you get that from what I was telling you about the last year for your pastor? Okay. And so we find Samuel and a very pragmatic God. I don't know if you've ever heard God described that way. The Israelites have forgotten who brought them out of those horrendous conditions of slavery in Egypt and into the land of milk and honey, which is where they are. Now it's unclear whether all of the people are demanding our, a king or whether it's just the leaders of the Israelite community. Did the leaders get their directive from the people? Did they have their ear to the ground, those leaders, and hear rumblings from their people about not being like the other nations around them? Bereft as they were without a human king? God's response reminds me of the cautions a parent might put to a child who we know is clearly making what is a bad decision, right? We've done that. We haven't said, no, you can't, but we've laid out with them sitting in front of us, here's what this might look like, right? This could be the consequences. God has Samuel list for the Israelite people all the ways that they will no longer be free as they are free under God's rule, which we understand they will have to bridge with now the human king's rule because they chose another king to govern them. They broke trust with God. God said it, right? Did you hear that in the reading? God said it. So from Thomas Curry's essay, The Spirituality of the Church, we hear the nature of the church. Let me see. Um, we hear the nature of the church, and it's a church nestled uh, within the story of a visit to a mountain town in France. All right. So Thomas Curry says, In 2012, it was my privilege to lead a group of students on a reformed heritage tour. We began in Paris, journeyed to Noyon, then headed to a number of other places, he says. However, we spent half a day in a little town up in the mountains south of Lyon. Le Chambon sur Lignon is not much bigger now than it was in 1940 when the French Reformed congregation there began sheltering Jewish children, saving, are you ready for this, some 3,000 or more from sure death of the Nazis. They got a brief tour uh, where the church worshipped. And he says, its architecture was almost severely reformed. No stained glass. No liturgical trappings. None of this. None of this. 
Only an open Bible on a raised pulpit facing a gathered congregation. There was, however, one piece of architecture that might have been described as ornamental. Over the entrance to the church, these words were etched in stone. Aimez-vous les uns les autres. Love one another. In some ways, those words seem to express the most threadbare of sentiments, he said. Is there any word in the English language more used and abused, more empty of substance than the word love? Yet here, he says, in this particular context, the words not only seemed unbearably heavy with the sacrifice and meaning, but also seemed to be the words that only the church could dare to say in the face of such a deep darkness. Love one another. How does one learn to say that in our day and time, he says? How does one learn to proclaim not as a, a kumbaya strategy to make warring parties settle down, but as the confident witness that only only church can render, a witness to the risen Lord's victory over death itself. And finally, how does one proclaim this word as the joyful gift that describes the nature and course of Christian discipleship? He says these questions are not easy to answer. Obviously, we're here every Sunday, right? No doubt the Holy Spirit must shape and reshape both our questions and answers, drawing us more deeply into the life of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Yet even to confess that is to acknowledge there is no easy way or even self-evident strategy for following after, for life in the spirit to be more than a pious sentiment, one must look to the source and character of that love that the Spirit reveals in him who bids us to love one another. Accordingly, the joy of Christ's embrace of this world is an earthly joy whose spirit, far from seeking some ethereal realm beyond the flesh, finds its pulse beating amidst the miseries and hurts and hopes of our quite fleshly lives. Such joy is the fruit of that spirit that witnesses in its own way to the freedom of Jesus, to the freedom of Jesus' presence among us, inspiring the strange, the strange and even unnerving confidence that he is Lord and that taking no thought for the morrow might prove the most faithful form of discipleship. And he says to return to Le Chambon and the witness rendered there during World War II, what is striking is not the remarkable shelter the congregation provided to those in great need or even the courageous love exhibited in those dark days, but rather the freedom and confidence that enabled that congregation to be the church of Jesus Christ. The spirituality of this church knew something of the incarnate Christ and the way in which, in which his scary freedom compelled those who followed to embrace the quite fleshly needs of this world. Just so, the confidence manifest in the witness of the congregation made it dangerous to the orders of its day, not through any overt threats, but merely through the rehearsal of the story that sustained its life, the story of Jesus Christ, the story of God with us. That story is as dangerous as it is joyful. It makes space, listen, listen, it makes space for the other where there is none. I'll end there.
We remember, don't we, the disciples gathered in that upper room at the time of Pentecost. One of the extraordinary things that happened that day of wind and fire was that everyone could hear, remember, the teachings in their own language. Thank you, Dee. I think this is what Paul is trying to get across to the Corinthian believers here in our reading. We all speak the same language, the language of Jesus. And it's what helped you believe in the first place. We are similar, you and me, says Paul. And this thought came to me while reading Jennifer Peetz's um, notes on this Corinthians reading. I thought, in light of how the Pentecost event occurred, her understanding of heaven aligned itself with this Pentecost event. She says, Paul invites them to envision the end time, when human distinctions between various groups of people will be leveled, leveled in the glorious presence of God. Do I hear an alleluia to that? Leveled. And as Paul is striving to bring them back, those Oh, Corinthians that are so problematic, back into relationship with him as their spiritual leader, Pete adds, Paul invites them to envision the end of time as the foundation for a new beginning of mutual trust in Christ with the present. Paul is calling them back into a relationship of mutual trust with one another, with Christ in the center of of that relationship. <laughs> How do we keep trust in the center of really any relationship? By communicating over and over again is what we are told time and again. Prayer is the heart of our communication with God. It is how we are bound together with one another on a Sunday morning, reciting the Lord's Prayer or confessing, confessing our sin openly with one another and before one another. It builds trust between us and our beloved creator. And when away from this space, we pray for one another because we are a community joined together by the Spirit and our Savior who also prayed, right? Here's an essay, The Paradox of Prayer, written by James F. K. Of course, my hope is always that what I offer will help us all with our understanding of our relationship to one another and to God. And he also explains a little of the overall troubles that Paul faces with the church community at Corinth. And he addresses the waiting we sometimes do in the shadow, and I, that's my word, in the shadow of our prayers. So let's hear what he has to say. I'm coming. Elaine. He says, embedded in the Pentecost hymn, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. There is a one sentence prayer. Teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. As we sing those words, we cannot help but think of the times we have offered or heard pastoral prayers for the sick, the dispossessed, the war-torn, the war -torn and the dying, all arguably intended to make some positive contribution, not only to ourselves, but to others, and not merely through our becoming more resolved to support those in need. So when those for whom we prayed did not recover or died despite our prayers, such might be taken as examples of unanswered prayer. And ironically, any prayer asking for patience with unanswered prayer might itself, well, go unanswered. Nevertheless, are there any prayers that God does not answer, he asks. I thought it might be more accurate to say that we may ask for things which God does not grant, so that what we may call unanswered prayers are really God's answer to those prayers. If so, we might call this the paradox of unanswered, answered prayer. 
Shall I say that again? The paradox of unanswered answered prayer. Likewise, the answers we sometimes receive for ourselves or for others may be other than the ones for which we asked. Moreover, the non-answers we have received or may ever receive in this life may be ascribed to the difference between our desired timing for immediate divine action and the inscrutable mystery of when God's promised kingdom will finally come. True, we may join Garth Brooks in singing our thanks that we did not get that for which we prayed. I'm sure you know that song. On the other hand, lamentably, we or those for whom we prayed may also suffer further or die before receiving the requested healing or wholeness for which we or they did pray. In either case, this doesn't mean we shouldn't ask for what we think and feel either we or others need now. In the presence of God, we do not have to self-censor our prayers before we pray them. We do not have to repress our desires by biting our tongues with noble, stoic rationality. Rather, in everything, Paul writes, make your requests known to God. The writers of the Psalms often let loose with their prayers of lament. Remember, we did a lot of lament this year. Complaint, and yes, even in tones of anger or resentment, and not always sounding ethically admirable. If that is true in the scriptural record of our prayer, we can trust that God will take care of nuancing our prayers and the timing of their answers. Some of Paul's Corinthian detractors thought otherwise. They thought prayer was all about getting immediately a particular answer, that of elevated ecstatic existence. And yes, Paul could match their high-flying spiritual experiences with a few of his own, and he bluntly, perhaps tactlessly, tells them so. Paul reminds these high flyers that true prayer is not an escape hatch from mundane life, a place where we can look down on others less fervent than ourselves. For Paul took a risk and shared with the Corinthians a time when he found himself brought back down to earth. The Lord did not remove Paul's thorn in his flesh. The Lord did not alter the circumstances that were tormenting that preacher. But whatever those circumstances were, the Lord promised Paul that his grace would be sufficient, that the power of Christ would dwell within him so that he could live in the circumstances, whatever they were, but no longer under the circumstances as if they were God. This is not wishful, willful, magical thinking. This is the admittedly often unexpected but ever new miracle of God's grace. That power which breaks in upon us and reframes impossible situations, not as opportunities for ecstatic existence, but as opportunities for eccentric existence, to be on hand for others. Did you hear that? To be on hand for others as agents of hope because the Lord is at hand. Through the event of prayer, we discover again and again, sometimes when we least expect it, and when there is little evidence for it, that we are sought and found by the one who hears our deepest yearnings and grasps our hand. Even when circumstances do not change, we waited a long time, didn't we? God's promised grace is sufficient for you and me. Even when we have no idea in advance what enabling patterns grace will take and achieve in our specific circumstances, the promise is that God's grace will be sufficient for us. And because grace is real, and because grace is real, our outlooks change. You hear that? Our outlooks change. We begin to look up, to look ahead, and not just sideways or sidewise at the circumstances otherwise making us bitter or driving us crazy. Amid his anxiety for all the churches, grace brought to Paul the promised peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. And with that peace that Paul could not bestow on himself, he was enabled to rise with Christ above the worries of his missionary and pastoral work. 
And as our precious Lord again takes our hand, the peace of God, the all-sufficient grace of God, reframes our own anxieties. The power of grace puts them into a new framework and gives us a new perspective. That's how it's supposed to go, folks. We return to live and to work amid difficult circumstances and to Paul's list of insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. We could add our own current circumstances. When we bring everything to God in prayer, the promised peace of God quiets our minds so that they do not undo us. Our once anxious hearts otherwise worn down and worn out, are again lifted up in praise and thanksgiving. With the psalmist, we can say to the Lord, who is near in every miserable, intractable circumstance, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. This little church on a mountain in France was looking right in the face of the end times. As we heard Jennifer Peets claim, is the foundation for a new beginning of mutual trust. Maybe, maybe, do you think, do you think they wonder where God is in such a time as that? But they did not wait. They did not wait. It is not the church's job to remain pious and look away from the world, mm -mm. only to keep its eyes firmly focused on the love of Christ while we do. That's our job. And where the love ultimately emanates from, which is our, so I'll, I'll try that again, okay? It is not the church's job to remain pious and look from the world. Its job is only to keep its eyes firmly focused on the love of Christ while we do what we do. And the love ultimately emanates from our border and boundary crossing God. We hear that? Aimez-vous les uns les autres. Love one another. Amen?